Open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 9. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to keep the theme of the special the choir sang this morning, the hope of the nations. Today, all you have to do is watch, listen, or read the news. And it seems like everything is in turmoil. Either you like what happened in the election or you hate what happened in the election. You're supportive or you're going to do everything you can to disrupt uh, what's going on. And it's not only here. It's going on all over the world. In every nation, it seems like, there's turmoil going on and which way do they go, which way do they stay, all these things that are happening. But Jesus is the hope of the nations. You see, whether you like what happened during the election or not, Trump isn't the answer, nor was Obama the answer, nor Bush before him, nor Clinton before him, or Bush or Carter or Ford or whoever, just keep going back. They were never the answer. Jesus is the answer. Amen. And he is the one that as the church we should be looking to. He is the one that throughout the history of the world People have looked to, to provide the solution to all of the problems that are in the world. Now we're going to look at that this morning, and we're going to look at it from a historical point of view that the Jews would have had, and then we're going to look at it from our point of view, and the outlook that we as a church should have. Not only the outlook that we as a church should have, but the impact that we as the church should be making today. So stand with me as I read a couple of verses, Isaiah chapter 9 and verses 6 and 7. There are few Bibles if you don't have a Bible, and it's on the screen as well. Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 and 7. For to, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the shoulder will be upon his, or the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. For upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with justice, judgment and justice, from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Father, as we come to you today, we give you all honor and glory for everything that you're doing. We look to your kingdom that you will rule and reign in, and that this world will change from rebellion to obedience. And I pray today, Father, that we as the church will be able to see that we are a part of that, not just in the future, but today and that we will do the things that are necessary to be able to fulfill the mission that you've given us to do. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. When we think about all the things that are going on and everything, terrorism and economy, all the relationships between different people, the morality of the nation, or we could even say lack of morality 
of the nation and everything else that is taking place, then we know that we need help. And we've seen over and over that the government is not the help that we need. Now, there are things governments can do. There are things that presidents and congresses and Supreme Courts can do that can be helpful or they can be hurtful in the actions that they take. But whatever they do, it's not permanent. It's not something that is going to last, something that is going to make a lasting difference. Whatever they do, even if we had a president, a Congress, a Supreme Court that said everyone must memorize the Ten Commandments. Everyone, if you're stopped by a policeman on the street and they say, give us the Ten Commandments in order or you go to jail, how many of you would go to jail this morning? But if they pass that law and we all memorize the Ten Commandments and everyone in the country memorized the Ten Commandments, memorized the model prayer, able to recite at least one book in the Bible, choose the book that you want Jude. Or third John. Choose the book of the Bible that you want to memorize and if they ever stop you and ask you and you can do that and you can say the model prayer, you can, memor you can recite the book of Revelation and not miss a word or Isaiah and not miss a word and then you can say the Ten Commandments in order, you're still not going to heaven. <laughs> because that's not going to get you there. And a lot of times that's what we as the church are pushing, thinking that that is going to save someone. But only Jesus can save someone. And they are only saved through repenting of their sins and by faith inviting Him to come into their life to be their Savior and their Lord. That's the only way that they're going to be saved. So we can say all these things and do all these things and the government can make all kinds of rules and we can say they're good rules. We could even say, well, if the government wants to say everybody's got to be a Baptist and especially a Southern Baptist, that would be great. <laughs> but what if someone else comes in and they say everyone's got to be a Catholic? or everyone's got to be a Jehovah's Witness, or everyone's got to be a Mormon. You see, you can't do those things. We've got to be able to choose. So if the government is not the answer to our problems, if the government is not going to solve the moral dilemma that we as a nation are in, or all the other nations, is there any hope for the world or hope of the nations? Well, today we celebrate the birth of that hope, Amen. the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you see, as I just read, a child, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. In the New King James, there's a comma between Wonderful and Counselor. In other versions, it's Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, 
the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. We have the prophecy. Last week we looked at the prophecy that he would be born of a virgin. Last night, the glory of that wondrous night that Jesus was born. And today that he, the government, will be established with him as the ruler of that government. I want to look at it, as I said earlier, in two different ways. I want to look at it from a historical perspective, the way the Jews looked at it at that time. Because when we understand what they were looking for and what was going on, then we will also be able to understand better what he has done for us and how it affects us today. So when we look at this, if we were to go back and start reading chapter 9 from verse 1, which is what we should always do instead of just picking a couple of verses, but go back and read it, we would find prophecy of the defeat and imprisonment of Israel and Judah. We would find that they were going to be taken into captivity. We would find that they would be treated harshly. And we would also find that God was going to provide a way out of that captivity for them. And when we get to the end of that, that God is going to provide a way out of the captivity, then we begin with verse 6, For unto us is born, just like last night, unto uh, the shepherds out in the field, when the heavenly host and the heavens rolled back and the heavenly host were there. And they said, For unto you, a child is born. And Isaiah in this prophecy said, For unto us a child is born. So God had told the Israelites, You're going to be defeated. You are going to be taken into captivity. You are going to be treated harshly in captivity. But a deliverer will come. And you will be set free from that captivity, and to, unto us this child is born. The one that the government is going to be upon his shoulders. So the average Jew, all Jews, that had faith in God, believed that God was going to send a Messiah, a Savior, a Deliverer. Because they were going to be defeated. And they were going to be taken into captivity. The northern kingdom of Israel would be defeated by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom of Judah would be defeated by the Babylonians. And the ones in the northern kingdom were going to be dispersed. They were going to be sent out into other countries. The Babylonians would come and take the Jews as hostages and slaves and take them into Babylonia. And then they would be defeated by the Medes and the Persians. And they would be defeated by the Greeks. And they would be in captivity during these periods of time until they were allowed to go back and rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the walls of the city. But then the Romans would come in, and they would be enslaved to the Romans at the time of the birth of Jesus. So all this time, they were looking forward to this Messiah, this Savior that God was going to send. They weren't thinking about, He's coming to forgive us of our sins. That wasn't their concept at all. They looked at him as coming to establish the Jewish government again. And that's the prophecy that he would come and that he would rule from the city of David, Jerusalem. That he would come and that he would rule and that he would be the king 
over all Israel. So when Jesus was born, and then that final week when he entered into Jerusalem, the Messiah has come. Hallelujah, Hosanna, waving the palm branches, putting them in the road in front of him. The Messiah is here. He's come to set up the kingdom. But that wasn't the kingdom that he came to set up. He came to rule, but not on earth. Now he will come to rule on earth. When he comes back for the church before the tribulational period begins and then comes back at the end of the tribulation and sets up the millennial kingdom on earth. Now in Revelation chapter 20, in verses 2 to 7, the thousand-year reign of Christ is mentioned five times in those verses. Revelation 20, 2 to 7. It's hard to get away from that, folks. If we say there is not going to be a millennial kingdom, you've got to do something with those thousand years that are mentioned five times during Revelation chapter 20. Verses 2 to 7. He's going to come back and he's going to set up his kingdom. Now, we can look at Revelation 20 and see something about it, but we can also go right over from where you're at right now, if you kept your finger there, to chapter 11. And we can see something about that kingdom as well. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Now listen. The wolf shall also dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a young child shall lead them. The cow, cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the winged child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For as the earth shall be full of knowledge of the Lord, as the waters shall cover the sea. We can say, hurry up. Come on, Jesus. So that can happen. So that there can be a kingdom where you are ruling from this earth. Where there is a time that all the animals shall get along together. A child shall sit by a cobra and not worry about being bitten or put its hand in the hole and not worry about it biting. A time when people get along and all these other things come about. Come on, Jesus. Come back for your church. Let the seven years of tribulation get over with. So this kingdom can begin. But if we go back to Revelation chapter 20, and it talks about the millennial kingdom, and Satan is cast into the bottomless pit at the beginning of that millennial kingdom, and he doesn't have anything to do with it, the Bible says at the end of the thousand years that Satan will be let out, and he'll go back and forth over the earth, and be able to gather an army as great as the sands of the seashore. 
in rebellion against Jesus Christ, who rules and reigns on this earth. So we could go there and we can say, I look forward to the time that Jesus is reigning here on earth because everything is going to be great. Everyone is going to follow him and there's going to be perfect obedience. But there will be enough as the sands of the sea to rebel against him at the end of that thousand years. But that's the historical perspective. That's what the Jews were looking for. The Messiah to come to set up his kingdom, to restore rule to the nation of Israel. But how do we interpret it? Well, kind of the same way, but different also. You see, we're in bondage as well, just as the Israelites were. And we need a Messiah to set us free from the bondage that we're in. Our bondage isn't to another nation. The mistreating isn't the whip or something else that they would do to us. But we're in bondage to Satan. We're in bondage to sin. And we need to be set free from that. And we've looked at that leading up to our Christmas as well. That we need to be set free from that bondage to sin. And Jesus came to set us free. And if we accept him, he will set us free. And we're no longer in bondage to sin. When people say, now I'm going way out on a limb here. When people say, I can't help it. I can't stop it. It's an addiction. It's this, it's that, and it's got a hold of me. Listen to me. Jesus came to set you free. And if he sets you free, you're free. There's nothing that can hold you. There's nothing that is stronger than the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to be free... Whatever it is, then he will set you free from it. And you can serve him and you can live for him. So even though we are in bondage to sin, he came to set us free from that bondage so that we can live and we can be free to serve him and do the things that he would have us to do. But what about that kingdom? What about that kingdom that he came to set up? Well, I can look forward to the millennial kingdom. I can say, come, Lord Jesus. I can say, I wish that before today was over that Jesus would come back for the church. And if he were to come back for the church, then hopefully, mo- hopefully all of us, but at least most of us would get to be caught up, raptured up to meet him in the air. But I don't have to wait for that. Because his kingdom has already been established, the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not just in heaven. It's not just on the earth during the millennial reign of Christ. The kingdom of God is here right now. The kingdom of God is here. In me and in you. If you're a born again child of God. You see, Jesus is already on the throne. He's not going to ascend to the throne. He's already on the throne. The kingdom has already been established and is already reigning from that throne in this kingdom. Well, why? If Jesus is reigning, 
in our lives, in our hearts, because his kingdom is already here and it's in us, then why on earth is the world in such a shape as it is? Why is our country in such a shape as it is? Why are there abortions? Why are there other things? Why are, is there so much immorality in the country? Why is there so much in the church? We don't even have to talk about the country. We can talk about the church in general. Why is the church in such a shape as it is? And this morning, as I was sitting and thinking and praying about the things I was going to say today, a thought came to my mind and I thought, well, I don't need to say that. Folks, the church has pretty much become a cesspool because anything and everything goes on in churches around this nation. And I'm not putting down other churches or other things. We've got enough to be concerned about here at Brown Road. But if Christ is ruling in our lives, why are there cliques? Why are there church politics? Why are there disruptions in the fellowship of the church? If Christ is ruling and Christ is reigning, I don't have to scream at you and yell at you that I'm a leader. If Christ is ruling and Christ is reigning, we don't have to worry about schisms coming about in the church if Christ is on the throne. But it's only when we kick him off and we ascend to the throne that we begin to try and assert ourselves and churches then begin to crumble and fall apart because we or our group wants our way. The Bible says that we are ambassadors of Christ and we represent the kingdom of God here on this earth. We do not have a right to represent ourselves. We don't even represent Brown Road Baptist Church. We represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And whatever we do should bring honor and glory to Him. It should never point the way to us. And what I want or what you want, the hope of the nations has been here for almost 2,000 years, over 2,000 years. The hope of the nations was born in Bethlehem one night. And he is ruling right now. You all have heard me say this a bunch of times. There would be no legalized abortion in this nation if the church had not quit being the church. Amen. There would not be the moral problems that we have today if the church had not quit being the church. The church went into decline and because the church went into decline, we decided we've got to become like the world so that the world will feel comfortable coming into the church. That was never God's intent. 
The world's not supposed to feel comfortable coming into the church. They're supposed to feel conviction when they come into the church and turn from their sins to Jesus Christ. The church has always existed as the alternative to what's out there, not just a little bit more of what's out there. The hope of the nations is reigning. And it should be reigning in your life and in your heart today. If someone were to ask you who you are, there are a lot of different things as a Christian you can say. You can say, I'm a blood-bought child of God. You can say, I'm a stranger here on this earth. My citizenship is in heaven. You can say, the God that spoke and everything that is came into existence, appointed me as an ambassador to earth to be his representative here on this earth. That's who you are, Christian. And if we do it, and if we do our job, then the kingdom of God is going to make a difference. If the church becomes the church again and not just another civic organization to make people feel okay with who they are instead of pointing the way to Jesus and stating unequivocally that unless you repent of your sins and receive him as your Lord and Savior. You will spend eternity separated from him in the lake of fire that is called hell. The hope of the nations is here. The hope of your life and your eternity is here. And he wants to make a difference in you. He wants to make a difference in this world. Let me give you a good thought. I put my faith and my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you put your faith and your trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord of your life? You've already done that. You put your faith and your trust in Him. And you believe that whenever this life is over, He's going to take you home to heaven and you're going to be there for all eternity, right? Amen. He's put His faith and His trust in you because He's left you here. He doesn't want you in heaven right now. If He did, He'd take you. And he hasn't left you here because he's mad at you. <laughs> he's left you here because he put his faith and his trust in you. He gave you a job. He gave you a calling, a high calling as an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven. And he says, I believe you can do it. I believe you'll do it. And when I'm ready for you, I'll bring you home. But until I bring you home, I'm trusting you. I've got all my faith in you that you're not going to let me down. That you're going to fulfill the calling, the ministry, that I have given you until I do bring you home. Are you doing it, Christian? He trusts you. He's 
He's got faith in you. Are you letting him down? By not letting him reign in your life? Now don't tell me. We can all say, oh yes I am. But what are you like when you're not here? Sometimes what are you like when you are here? <laughs> what do you say about other people? How do you talk about other people? What kind of language do you use when you're not in church or around other church people that may not use that language? Is he really reigning in your life? The hope of the nations will make a difference, but only when he makes a difference in us and we go out and we fulfill the mission that he's given us. If you're here today and you've never invited Jesus to come into your life, maybe you come forward, maybe you've agreed with some stuff, maybe you've even been baptized, but you've never truly invited him to your life to be your Lord and your Savior, I'm going to ask you to come this morning and do that. Let him start ruling and reigning in your life. If you're here this morning and you know this is where God wants you to worship and serve him at, and you're not a member of Brown Road, but God wants you to be, then you need to come and join this morning. Father, as we come to you again, Lord God, I just pray that you will be glorified through the decisions that are going to be made this morning. Because whether anyone comes forward or not, there are going to be decisions that are made. They'll either be yes for you or no against you. So if the Holy Spirit's convicting and there's those in here that need to come and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that they will do that. Be forgiven and receive the gift of eternal life. That there will be others that will come and join the church others to come under watch care and that we will all say yes to you today and I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So as we stand and sing, trust and obey, you need to come and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you come on, or to join the church, you come this morning as we sing, come on.